Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching my talk. My name is Jonathan Metzman, and I work on Chrome security, specifically the fuzzing team, Bugs Minus Minus. Today, I'm going to talk to you about fuzzing, which is an easy way for any developer to make Chromium more secure. The outline of this talk is as follows. First, I explain the basics of fuzzing, such as what it is and why fuzzing is useful. Then I go into some more practical details, such as how we use fuzzing and how to write good fuzzers. So what is fuzzing? Fuzzing is an automated bug finding technique where randomized inputs are fed to a target program in order to get that target program to crash. And the idea behind this is that computers are cheaper than humans and can find some bugs better than humans. So rather than using humans to find bugs, we'll use computers instead. So why should you care about fuzzing? Fuzzing is worth knowing about because it is one of the most accessible and effective bug finding techniques. Each year, fuzzing finds hundreds of security vulnerabilities and thousands of other bugs that affect stability in Chromium. One of the earliest fuzzing tools was something called the monkey. The monkey tested GUI programs on Mac OS by sending them things like random clicks and key presses in order to get those GUI programs to crash. And the idea behind this is similar to if a monkey were playing at the computer, you know, mashing on the keyboard and sending random uh, and clicking randomly. The fuzzers we're going to be discussing today uh, work rather differently than the monkey, but the basic idea of crashing programs through randomized and unexpected inputs is essentially the same. Let's use a concrete example of something that you can fuzz in Chromium. Uh, I'm going to use V8, which is Chromium's JavaScript engine. It's basically the interpreter for JavaScript uh, you know, when you're browsing the web and need to execute some JavaScript. Now, on the left, uh, you can see some very primitive fuzzing I did of V8. I basically took uh, some random data from wrandom and put it in a file, fuzz.js, and then I ran V8 on that file. And as you might predict, uh, so like over here, I've catted uh, fuzz.js and you can see the contents look nothing like actual JavaScript. So as you might be able to tell, uh, this doesn't actually run in V8. V8 says this is a syntax error. It fails to parse this JavaScript file and it quits out immediately. Now, on the right, though, we have a snippet uh, from a actual bug report reported by an external developer uh, that could crash V8. This did crash an old, uh, older version of Chrome when you executed it in V8. Now, even though this code over here isn't very complex, uh, the odds of our primitive fuzzer uh, on the left actually producing code like this are pretty low. You know. If we had infinite time maybe and did this over and over again, you might be able to produce something like this, but in reality, we're never gonna produce something like this and we won't find this crash in V8. So can we do better than this primitive fuzzer? One easy way we can do better is by starting with real JavaScript and mutating it instead of just starting with uh, random garbage like I did on the previous slide. So on the top of this slide, we have uh, a JavaScript function that I wrote. And it's pretty simple. It just takes an argument name, appends it to a string, and then uh, prints the resulting string and returns it. I ran this function, or I gave this function to a mutator called Redamsa. And Redamsa spat out this uh, code below. Now, Redamsa is a generic uh, fuzzer. It doesn't know anything about JavaScript. It just does mutations that are uh, you know, work for a lot of formats. So here, uh, let's try and figure out what Redamsa did. It looks like it deleted a line and then duplicated another line. So we end up with two prints and not the append. Um, and so with this approach, actually, we might eventually, you know, with thousands of attempts, we might eventually be able to produce something like the snippet we saw over here and crash V8. Another way we can do better is to teach our fuzzer about JavaScript, meaning that our fuzzer will be aware of the format it's fuzzing instead of just doing generic mutations like deleting lines and copying lines. This kind of fuzzing is called format-aware fuzzing. So instead of doing these uh, generic mutations, as I said, 
Uh, we'll do smarter ones like, um, you know, for JavaScript, it would be something like maybe changing the value of a variable or changing the arguments passed to a function or, you know, uh, adding random function calls, that sort of thing. And so this snippet that I have over here is from uh, a real format aware fuzzer for JavaScript. Uh, the fuzzer is called JS Fun Fuzz. And this is the code in JS Fun Fuzz that creates for loops. As you can see, uh, it's creating a for loop by like appending, you know, for to uh, a uh, initialization expression, you know, a condition, a loop condition, and uh, you know, an um, an increment uh, operation. Format aware fuzzing works very well, and security folks in Chromium use it heavily. However, it requires a lot of effort, so usually it's not the best choice for fuzzing, and it's not going to be the main technique I discussed today. The main technique for fuzzing that I discussed today is coverage guided fuzzing. And if anyone here has heard of uh, AFL or libfuzzer, these are the techniques that they use. And the reason why I'm gonna be focusing on coverage guided fuzzing is because it makes writing a fuzzer very simple. All you need to do to write a fuzzer is write something called the harness, which is just a little bit of code that accepts test cases from something called the fuzzing engine and passes it to the targeted code. Now, the fuzzing engine is what actually mutates uh, test cases. And because it's, uh, you know, the fuzzing engine is like a library that you're using, you don't need to spend your time uh, teaching the fuzzer about the format. Uh, the fuzzing engine does generic mutations, but through the use of code coverage, the fuzzing engine will learn how to produce interesting test cases. So let's see how coverage guided fuzzing works. First, the fuzzer will pick uh, a test case at random from a collection of test cases called the corpus. And I'll explain where the corpus comes from uh, later on on the slide. So it picks a test case from the corpus randomly, and they'll pick some mutations to do on that test case randomly. So, you know, these are mutations like flipping bits, deleting bytes, copying bytes from one part of the test case to another, and it'll produce a mutated test case that then gets fed to the targeted code. And the targeted code runs on this test case. And if the targeted code crashes, the fuzzer will stop fuzzing and save the crash. But if the targeted code doesn't crash, as will happen in most cases, the fuzzer will examine the target and see if the test case caused the target to execute any new code. And if it did cause the target to, if it did execute new target code, then it saves that test case to the corpus. Uh, otherwise, it'll just discard it. And then in either case, uh, the fuzzer will, this whole process will start again. The fuzzer will pick uh, a random test case from the corpus and mutate it. Uh, but now, you know, if we added a test case to the corpus, it'll have a chance to mutate that new test case. So now let's see how this process actually can produce interesting test cases with an example. Uh, before we start, just note that I'm going to simplify things a little bit for, uh, you know, to make things easier to explain. But the core of what I'm saying is true. So suppose we're fuzzing the code on the left, uh, and we're starting with the test case foobar in our corpus. So this code will just look at the first two uh, elements in an array. And if the first two elements spell out high, it'll execute this crash function. And so when we're fuzzing, you know, let's say we want to execute this crash function because we're trying to get the target uh, program to crash. <laughs> so I'm going to highlight the parts of the code that the test cases that the corpus covers in green. So foobar, for example, will only cover the first line in this target program because uh, foobar, the first letter in it, is not H. So it fails this first if condition. So it doesn't get any further into the program. So we start fuzzing. And the first time the, mute, the fuzzer mutates a test case in our corpus, it'll probably do something uh, useless. Like in this example, it might produce the test case foobar11. And of course, foobar11 does not uh, pass the first if condition because the first character is not H. So it won't get any further into the program and thus the fuzzer won't add it into our corpus. Excuse me one second. So after you know, thousands of attempts at mutating, eventually the fuzzer might actually do a useful mutation and produce a test case that can cover new code in the target. So in this example, suppose 
the fuzzer produces the test case who bar. Well, that will pass the first if condition and the target will execute the second line. Uh, who bar won't pass a second if condition, but we have discovered new code in the target. So now who bar will be added to the corpus. And now our corpus will contain both foo bar and who bar. Now that we've got two test cases in our corpus, the fuzzer will sometimes mutate who bar and sometimes foo bar. And suppose, you know, like before, uh, it'll mostly do useless mutations. So uh, let's say that it produces a H O O B A. Well, that's not going to get in any further into the uh, into the test in the target code either. So that won't be added to the corpus, uh, and we'll discard it. And then again, you know, after thousands and thousands of tries, we might the fuzzer might happen to do uh, a random mutation that is useful. So let's say it happens to produce the test case H I O O bar. Well, that will pass the second if condition, and that'll cause the crash function to get executed, which is what our goal was. So this is essentially how coverage guided fuzzing works. As you can see, the mutator isn't smart, but because interesting inputs are added to the corpus, after many attempts, the fuzzer can evolve progressively more interesting test cases. Before we move on, I wanna point out that this example uh, was a simplification again. Um, in reality, the fuzzing engines we use in Chromium can fuzz this code much more easily because uh, those uh, fuzzing engines do um, do special, uh, they have some like special magic for uh, comparison operations in the program. And so they'll learn, you know, in this, in this case, they would learn to produce, you know, to add H or I into uh, test cases much more frequently. Now that you have a solid understanding of fuzzing, let me go into more detail about why it is important. I mentioned how fuzzing is great at finding crashes but you might be thinking uh, who actually cares about crashes, right? Like you can probably crash Chromium yourself by opening a bunch of tabs. Well, the crashes fuzzing finds are actually very different from this. And one reason why these crashes are different is because Chromium is written in C++. That's a bit of a simplification, but uh, there's a fair amount of truth to that. So because Chromium is written in C++, so sorry, C it is written in C++ because C++ is one of the best uh, programming languages for writing fast and high performance programs like Chromium. But the speed that C++ provides, uh, it doesn't come for free. Uh, C++ actually trades something called memory safety for speed. And uh, an example of this trade-off is in C++, when you write to an array, there's nothing actually checking that that array is large enough for you to write to it. So, you know, because that would slow down the language, of course, if it checked it at runtime. So if you write past the end of an array in C++, you can actually corrupt important parts of the program and lead the program to crash. So this crash is very different from, you know, opening too many tabs in Chromium because, you know, that one's just running out of memory, but this is actually corrupting, uh, you know, internal data structures that control uh, what parts of code the program is executing. And the reason why memory corruption is a security issue is because hackers can do it uh, very carefully so that instead of crashing the program, they'll corrupt these essential data structures so that they can basically take control of the entire program and get it to do uh, pretty much anything they want. Uh, and if you don't believe me, there was a case in Chromium OS where there was a one byte write past the end of a buffer. And uh, a researcher found that th they were able to use this to take control over the entire uh, Chromebook using uh, this small memory corruption bug. <laughs> now, there are some additional reasons why fuzzing Chromium is important that I want to get into now. Um, now, this is discussed a little bit more in the security talk, but the security expectations of Chromium are very high. Uh, Chromium has to take all kinds of dangerous inputs from anywhere on the web and do kind of crazy things with them. For example, Chromium is supposed to run JavaScript from anywhere on the web, and it's supposed to allow this JavaScript to do things like, you know, create pop-ups or do math, but it's not supposed to allow the JavaScript to do things like delete your files on your disk. And this is a very hard problem, and there are a lot of ways that a hacker could subvert this. And so because Chromium is expected to securely handle all of these uh, inputs uh, from potentially evil sources, 
Fuzzing is good because it sort of simulates what those sources could possibly give to Chromium. Another challenge in Chromium is that a lot of the code in Chromium is actually from third-party open source packages. And this code is generally written by developers who don't work on Chromium. So the quality of that code could be rather different from the quality of like the first party Chromium code. Another reason you should use fuzzers is because of its long track record of finding security bugs in Chromium. Overall, uh, Chromium, uh, or there have been over 19,000 uh, crashes, unique crashes discovered in Chromium through fuzzing, and over, uh, over 4,000 uh, security vulnerabilities found in Chromium through fuzzing. Now, the reason why it's important to find uh, these security bugs with fuzzing and fix them is because if you don't find them, someone else can, and they might use it uh, for nefarious purposes. So uh, on this slide, I have an example of a bug in the Linux kernel. And this bug was happened to be found by a team at Google that does uh, Linux kernel fuzzing, but the bug made its way into Android phones anyway. And later on, Google found that this bug was used to hack Android users. And the same thing can happen in Chromium. Each vulnerability that isn't fixed is a potential opportunity for attackers to harm Chromium users. So let's discuss some advantages fuzzing has over other bug finding techniques. The first of these techniques that I wanna discuss is testing. Manually written tests such as unit tests and integration tests are important. And you should write them because they are great at verifying functionality, but they are not a replacement for fuzzers. In most cases, you would need to write thousands of tests to test the same area of code that a fuzzer can do pretty easily. And of course, writing those thousands of tests is gonna be far from easy. For example, let's say we wanted to test an image parser. If you were to do something like scrape the web uh, for every image and then feed those images to the parser, there's a good chance that you still wouldn't even find all the bugs that a fuzzer would find because the fuzzer produces some inputs that are so weird that they'll never be found in the wild. Now, another technique I wanna discuss is reading source code to find bugs, uh, which is called auditing. Auditing is another useful bug finding technique. And many of the best bug finders, uh, bug hunters rather, like people that you know, just spend all day finding bugs, rely heavily on auditing. Uh, and in theory, auditing can find all of the bugs fuzzing can find and more. But in practice, it's often easier to fuzz than to audit. Auditing can be pretty exhausting work and it requires a lot of skill. And if computers can do the, uh, you know, do the work of finding the bugs for you, why not use the computers instead of using your own time? Another reason to, uh, for fuzzing over auditing is that unlike auditing, a fuzzer is forever. If you have a fuzzer for certain code, it's usually easy to rerun that fuzzer when that code is changed. There might be a little bit of maintenance involved, but generally it, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to rerun the fuzzer. On the other hand, auditing that same code again won't be so easy. So in other words, writing a fuzzer will be like a one-time cost and auditing won't be. Finally, the last technique I wanna compare fuzzing to is uh, a sort of automated version of what we we're discussing in the last slide, uh, automated source code analysis. And this is sometimes called static analysis because we aren't running the code. Uh, fuzzing in contrast is a form of dynamic analysis because it involves running the code. So static analysis is very useful. Uh, your compiler uses it, for example. Here we've got uh, Clang warning us about a potential memory corruption vulnerability where we write past the end of an array. But in practice, uh, it's pretty hard to find non-trivial bugs with static analysis. And so fuzzing is generally a better choice than static analysis. And so we tend to use it more in Chromium. So now that I've sold you on fuzzing, let's explore how to fuzz. Because the idea of fuzzing is to spend computer time finding bugs rather than human time, the fuzzing workflow in Chromium is designed to be very automated and very easy. The only steps that aren't automated are writing a fuzzer and fixing bugs. Everything else in Chromium is automated by it's fuzzing infrastructure called cluster fuzz that I'll discuss later on. There are three kinds of fuzzers that I will explain how to write for Chromium. We'll explore these uh, in the order of importance. So first, 
we're going to be talking about uh, structure unaware coverage guided fuzzers, such as LibFuzzer. That was what we saw before with the program that reads high and then crashes. Uh, then we're going to discuss a slight variant of this, which is structure aware coverage guided fuzzers. And this also uses LibFuzzer, but uses some additional tooling like uh, LPM or Mojo LPM for making your fuzzer structure aware. And then finally, we'll discuss uh, unguided structure aware fuzzers, uh, like the JavaScript fuzzer we spoke about before. And these are sometimes called black box fuzzers. We're not going to discuss uh, unguided structure unaware fuzzers, like the debut random fuzzing I did before, because that's usually not a good option uh, for fuzzing in Chromium. So let's dive into how to write uh, a coverage guided fuzzer in Chromium. <clears throat> this is probably the most important takeaway uh, from this talk. So, you know, because it's really the recommended technique for fuzzing in Chromium. So if you've been asleep for the last, uh, you know, for the rest of the presentation, just wake up for the next few slides and then you can go back to sleep. So writing a coverage guided fuzzer is very easy in Chromium and it's a lot like writing a unit test. First, you define a harness, uh, which will be a function named LVM fuzzer test one input. This harness or function will be called by a fuzzing engine, libfuzzer, and libfuzzer will pass it test cases using the data and size arguments. So data is going to be a pointer to the test case, and size is going to be the size of that test case. And essentially, what your harness needs to do is just take that test case and feed it to the code you want to test. So this harness is testing the uncompressed function in the snappy uh, in snappy. So it just basically takes that uh, that test case, converts it to the right kind of type that's accepted by the uncompressed function, and then calls the uncompressed function. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to write a lot of these harnesses. Um, oftentimes, it takes less than fifty lines of code to do so. Once you've written the harness, you just need to configure Chromium's build system to build your fuzz target or fuzzer. This is pretty easy, so I'm not going to go into it into too much in too much detail. But there's a similar process in Chromium OS if you're interested in fuzzing on Chromium OS, and you can just follow some of the documentation we've written or the examples uh, if you want to do this. Now, after you've done this step, you can commit your fuzzer to uh, Chromium, uh, you know, the Git repo, where it'll be automatically picked up, you know, built by ClusterFuzz and then run uh, by ClusterFuzz. Before we move on from coverage guided fuzzing, let's look at some best practices for writing coverage guided fuzzers. Since writing a coverage guided fuzzer is a lot like writing a unit test, a lot of the traits that make a unit test good also make a coverage guided fuzzer good. For example, speed is important because the mutator in a coverage guided fuzzer is generic. And so as we saw before, it needs lots of attempts to produce interesting inputs. Determinism is another thing that good unit tests and good fuzzers share. If the code that you're fuzzing isn't deterministic, you're not gonna you're gonna find non-deterministic crashes in that code. And those are gonna be much harder to fix than uh, crashes that are deterministic. Also, if your code that you're fuzzing is un not deterministic, the fuzzer is going to have a much harder time uh, determining which test cases cover new code because the you know randomly sometimes there'll be random there'll be code that's running uh, that's not due to the test case but just due to something like garbage collection. Some other best practices for your coverage guided fuzzer are adding a seed corpus and a dictionary. A seed corpus is a directory of existing inputs that are a good starting point for the fuzzer. If we're fuzzing something like a PNG parser, the seed corpus would be a directory of PNG files that use different PNG features. And what a dictionary is, is it's a file with a list of tokens that the fuzzer is supposed to insert randomly during mutation. So for example, if our fuzzer is fuzzing JavaScript, you should put JavaScript keywords like uh, function, or uh, break into your dictionary, and the fuzzer will insert these tokens during mutation, and then I'll increase the likelihood that it's going to do a useful mutation instead of a useless one. Now, although uh, seed corpuses and dictionaries go a little bit against this idea I've been discussing of 
making the computers do all the work. Providing a dictionary or a seed corpus is a way to invest just a small amount of effort uh, in order to get a big gain for fuzzing. So by helping the computer a little bit, you can have a big impact. Now, if you want even more control over your coverage guided fuzzer, you can make it structure aware. First, we'll start with tools for writing coverage guided structure aware fuzzers, LPM and Mojo LPM. And these coverage guided structure aware fuzzers will also use libfuzzer, but they're gonna use these additional tools for the structure awareness part. LPM is a mutator for protobuf. Protobuf is a data format like JSON, but with types. So you can use uh, protobuf to define a sort of schema, basically define the format that you're fuzzing. So for example, if we're fuzzing JavaScript, we could use protobuf to describe what an ad expression would look like. And here we've described an ad expression as taking two integer operands uh, and yeah, two operands that are both integers. And we can make this more complicated if we want. Protobuf has a pretty rich, it's, uh, it's pretty rich and lets you define all sorts of things. So we can make uh, each operand either a float or an integer, or we could do make each operand uh, another JavaScript ad expression. Like you could add one plus one plus one, right? So once you've defined uh, a pro, once you've defined your format using protobufs, LPM or libprotobuf mutator, as uh, the full name is will create test cases based on this spec that you've created. So here we've got an actual test case based on this ad expression uh, spec. And this actual test case has two integer operands, 10 and nine. Now you can see there's a problem with this test case and it's that this test case is just a representation of a JavaScript ad expression. It's not an actual ad expression and it's not you can't just pass this test case to V8 and hope it'll come back with 19. So we need to do one more thing before we're ready to feed this, before we're ready to feed the test case to V8, and that's convert this intermediate format into the actual format we're fuzzing. And that's fairly easy. You just take the add expression uh, object and you take each operand, you convert them to a string, and then you just create your add expression from there. And then from there, you can feed that input to the targeted code V8. Now, if we are fuzzing V8, you would probably, you'd have to write, you know, definitions for all sorts of expressions, such as function calls, you'd have to, you know, function definitions, uh, variable assignments. And so this would probably be pretty, uh, you know, quite a bit of work to write uh, a format aware fuzzer like this for uh, JavaScript. But oftentimes writing these fuzzers can be pretty rewarding. Another option we have for coverage guided fuzzers is something called Mojo LPM. Mojo is Chromium's framework for IPC or inter-process communication. And because Chromium's security model relies on processes, Mojo LPM is a good tool for fuzzing code that could potentially be used for sandbox escapes. The idea behind it is we automatically convert these things called Mojom files, which are similar to protos and basically describe the API that one process offers to another process. And we automatically convert those Mojum files into proto files so that LPM can create test cases uh, based on those Mojum files. Now, unlike with most LPM fuzzers, here you're not gonna be spending as much time writing uh, a schema or grammar and a converter for your protos. Instead, the time here will probably be spent on the harness. The last option uh, I'm going to discuss today for writing a fuzzer in Chromium is writing a structure aware unguided fuzzer, AKA a black box fuzzer. I don't have a lot of guidance here because these fuzzers are very flexible. You can follow our documentation on how to write one, but essentially your fuzzer must dump files to a directory and cluster fuzz will then feed those files to a target binary such as V8 or Chrome itself. And how you create these files uh, is entirely up to you. You can do it in any programming language you want. There's a lot of freedom there. Now, black box fuzzers are often useful for testing large parts of Chromium at once. They're almost, so for, 
black box buzzers are almost more like integration tests, whereas these coverage guided uh, buzzing harnesses are almost more like unit tests. So I mentioned, right, that they're much better for fuzzing large parts of Chrome at once. Uh, and as an example of that, uh, V8, which we've been discussing uh, fuzzing a lot in this presentation, a lot of the best fuzzers for V8 are black box fuzzers. And that's because V8 is too large to fuzz with coverage guided fuzzing. It's very slow, uh, V8, and it has a lot of non-deterministic behavior like garbage collection that messes up coverage guided fuzzing. So typically, as I said, the best fuzzers for uh, V8 are black box fuzzers. But most Chromium developers probably shouldn't write black box fuzzers. Coverage guided fuzzers are probably a better choice. Black box fuzzers are typically written by bug hunters. And one reason why I think these uh, fuzzers are favored by bug hunters is the skills involved in writing a black box fuzzer are different than the skills involved in writing uh, a coverage guided fuzzer. So like suppose I were a security researcher that doesn't work on Chromium and I, I'm, you know, I'm just good at finding bugs. I'm probably good at writing fuzzers. So writing a black box fuzzer it's probably pretty easy for me. You know, it's, it would be easier for me to just write a script that can create weird HTML files and then feed that to Chromium. But it would probably be hard for me if I don't know anything about Chromium development to figure out how to write harnesses to do coverage guided fuzzing because that involves uh, reading and writing a lot of uh, Chromium specific code. So now let's discuss the fun part of fuzzing in Chromium, cluster fuzz. In Chromium, cluster fuzz handles everything from running the fuzzer to finding a bug to verifying fixes. The only manual parts are writing fuzzers and fixing bugs. One important thing that cluster fuzz automates are builds. After your fuzzer is committed to the Chromium Git repo, Chromium will automatically do new builds of your fuzzer. Since we want to find as many bugs as possible, cluster fuzz fuzzes uh, many different kinds of builds since they will tend to find different kinds of bugs. For example, we fuzz both uh, Windows builds and Mac builds, as well as Linux builds. And the reason why is because if you fuzz Windows builds, you might find Windows only bugs, but you're not gonna find those bugs if you're only fun fuzzing Linux builds. <clears throat> Another important kind of build cluster fuzz uses are sanitized builds. A sanitized build is essentially a build that's built with a tool called a sanitizer. Uh, one imp very important sanitizer I'm gonna explain now it's called uh, Address Sanitizer, or ASAN for short. Address Sanitizer is useful for finding memory corruption bugs that wouldn't otherwise cause crashes. So uh, as you can see on the slide, um, I've got a program here that I just wrote. It is very simple. It just allocates some memory, frees it, and then returns a value from that allocated memory. And this is a straightforward use after free bug, which is a common bug that we see in Chromium and it's a security uh, problem. So you can see that I can compile this code and Clang doesn't warn me that there's an issue here and I can even run it and there is no crash, but there's still a bug there that we'd wanna find. So I can compile the same code with address sanitizer by using this flag, fsanitize equals address. And when I run the code again, when I run the program again, that'll, uh, it'll crash now. And that's because address sanitizer detects uh, memory corruption bugs and will cause the program to crash when it detects this. And this cluster fuzz uses to find even more bugs. Cluster fuzz uses uh, other sanitizers to detect other classes of bugs. Like there's one for undefined behavior. Uh, there's one for using uninitialized memory, which I happen to also do here as well. Um, and sanitizers in general are just a very good tool uh, outside of fuzzing. And uh, I highly recommend becoming uh, acquainted with them if you're not already. But the most important thing that cluster fuzz uh, automates is running your fuzzer. Cluster fuzz will run your fuzzer on tens of thousands of cores, so it'll get a lot of chances to find bugs. And cluster fuzz will also run your fuzzers continuously, which means that fuzzers written years ago are still running on cluster fuzz today. And this is very useful because new bugs can be introduced in old code when old code is modified. Fuzzers are sometimes the gift that keep on giving, and you know they could find these bugs, you know, years after they're written, they'll still they'll still be useful. If cluster fuzz finds a unique bug when fuzzing, it'll file an issue. Unique is important here since fuzzers will tend to find the same bug over and over again, 
and a cluster fuzz file dozens of issues for the same underlying bug, my team would be pretty unpopular with Chromium developers. So instead, cluster fuzz will only file bugs for unique crashes. In general, also, cluster fuzz is pretty good at uh, guessing which commit introduced the bug. So uh, here, you know, it mentions the commit that it thinks introduced the bug, and then it assigns the uh, issue to the author of that commit. And that's a, a nice feature because if you write a fuzzer that finds a bug that your coworker introduced, your coworker will have to fix it and not you. Another great feature that Cluster Fuzz offers are coverage reports, which are really useful for helping you uh, in the fuzzing process. So if you go to this uh, URL, you can see which parts of Chromium are being tested by fuzzers. And within these coverage reports, you can see which files and which directories are fuzzed. So here we could see that 56% of this uh, file is being covered by fuzzers. So let's investigate that further. You can see which function, you know, which which exact lines of code are being hit by the fuzzer and which aren't. So here we see that uh, a certain uh, that a certain function in PDFium is only being partially covered by fuzzers, and so we can maybe decide to aid the fuzzer more by coming up with a test case that can reach this code and then putting it in the seed corpus. So this is a good idea. Uh, you probably won't ever hit 100% coverage for a complex uh, component in Chrome, but this process is a good way for you to ensure that there aren't any you know, enormous gaps. So when should you write a fuzzer? If you're working on code that handles untrusted input, then it is very important to write a fuzzer. So by untrusted input, I mean you know, input that's not directly provided by uh, Chromium itself or the user. So like most web pages are untrusted input, uh, most images, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, another idea for when you should write a fuzzer uh, that I just mentioned is when there's uncovered code in a coverage report. And if you're working on a Chromium component, you should just periodically check the coverage of that component and figure out if fuzzing is missing something important. Another time I want to mention is when you're introducing third-party code into Chromium. And finally, a last signal uh, that you should write a fuzzer is when you receive a vulnerability report. It's better not to wait for this, but sometimes it happens. If someone outside of Chrome, Chromium reports a crash in code that isn't covered by fuzzing, it's a sign that you should improve fuzzing in that area. So to summarize what we've learned today, fuzzing is an effective technique for making code more secure. Fuzzing is easy and all developers can and should write fuzz targets. And finally, fuzzing in Chromium only requires writing a target and fixing bugs. Everything else is going to be automated by cluster fuzz. If you want more info on fuzzing, you should definitely check out the documentation I've linked to on this slide. Uh, this talk was only meant to be a high level overview and sort of sales pitch for fuzzing, but the documentation will actually explain how to do it properly. And also, you can reach out to us uh, if you have any questions about fuzzing. These are the uh, mailing lists uh, where people can ask questions about fuzzing for uh, Chromium and Chromium OS. Uh, thank you. And so I'll look at the questions now if anyone has them. OK, sure. Thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. And uh, I hope you learned something uh, useful, and I hope you Fuzz your code in Chromium. Have a nice day. Okay, let me. The trick you mentioned about the coverage fuzzer looking at what other cool tricks does it have? Um, so a lot of those tricks have uh, to do with um, comparison operations. So it wouldn't only do it for equal operations, it, it does it for um, a lot of other sort of common compares and programs. So, um, you know, like the uh, str str cmp uh, uh, c standard library function. You know, uh, the fuzzer can instrument those as well and tell what strings uh, are being compared against, and it'll also insert those strings into the uh, program. And uh, you know, so that's another um, you know trick that it has up its sleeve. So yeah, like. That case is actually uh, pretty trivial for fuzzers to do now, but like the original coverage guided fuzzers uh, didn't do these tricks for comparison operations. And so um, that's actually how they would work. Uh, the next question is uh, at Google, sorry, sorry the, the last question that I answered is the trick you mentioned for 
uh, about cover about our coverage guided fuzzer looking at equal operand sounds cool. What other cool tricks does it have? Uh, the next question I'm going to answer is at Google, all develop uh, all developers using fuzzing for their codes, or is it mostly done from the fuzzing team? Okay, uh, sorry if I wasn't clear about this, but it is definitely not mostly done by the fuzzing team. Um, developers typically write fuzzers for their own code. So um, especially the coverage guided fuzzers, those are probably 99% of them are probably written by uh, developers for their own code. So, you know, if you work on uh, PDFium, the PDF reader, you'll write uh, a fuzzer for PDF, a coverage guided fuzzer for PDFium. Um, the black box fuzzers though, on the other hand, uh, a lot of those tend to be written by um, not just the fuzzing team, but other people interested in security. And um, actually some people on V8 write those as well. But, you know, as I mentioned, uh, coverage guided fuzzing, I think is within the reach of all developers at Google, and that's how they tend to be used uh, at Google and in Chromium specifically as well. Good question. Um, I think that's okay. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a nice day, and I hope you fuzz your code. Bye bye.